Uh, we're back on Open Line. Uh, we're talking with Dr. Kimberly Brown. She, was, she is with Vanderbilt University. She's director of the Forensic Evaluation Team at Vanderbilt Medical Center. She has, her team has interviewed some of the, the biggest criminals here in Davidson County and made a report back to the court about whether they are insane, criminally insane or not. And so it's fascinating to talk to her and get her perspective on how this works. She's already said uh, there are a lot of myths surrounding this work. One is that many people uh, are declared uh, criminally insane. She says that's not the case at all. Fewer than 1% of all of those charged are declared uh, criminally insane. She said like 13 people uh, of the 250,000 people arrested uh, recently in the last year or so have been found uh, criminally insane. So it's very rare. It's not like what you see on TV. Um, she says another myth is that uh, people get away with it. Also that, that people try and fool them. That is certainly something they're aware of. It's certainly something they look at. But um, she says many times people who are actually insane don't want to be found to be insane. And so that's quite interesting as well. There are some states that don't even have this statute. And we just had a call from Wilma uh, who was asking about what do they do in those states and, and certainly it, it differs by state but in some cases there, there can be a finding by a judge um, uh, about their mental state, uh, but um, it, it was interesting to hear her discuss that. And so right now, our feed, we're doing this via Zoom, is down. And of course, there are storms all around us right now, and so that might be part of the reason. But we expect to be bringing Dr. Brown back and, and can ask her, she was talking about uh, uh, our last question, people that snap. And she thinks that's a myth. If I, if I understood you right, Dr. Brown, it's good to have you back. The, the question from Wilma was something along, along the lines of, what about people who snap? And you said that's rare. You might have said that's a myth. But what, what about this whole notion of, because we certainly see it, so much of what we see here is through TV and the movies. That's certainly something that, that you see uh, depicted. What about this notion of people snapping? Yeah, people slowly bend. They don't usually snap and break. So usually we see pretty significant warning signs and red flags happening for a while. Um, and usually when you look back, it, it's pretty sad because you can see the missed opportunities to intervene and to prevent sometimes a bad act from happening. The people who snap, uh, I'm not sure if you heard me say this before, but I think that just means that they get really angry um, and lose their temper and act out in a way that they regret later. And that's not mental illness, nor is that a condition that can qualify for an insanity defense. So snapping or blacking out, meaning you get really upset or really enraged or seek revenge or retaliation, that's not what we're talking about here. Because we're in talking the movies, about I mean, in the movies it is, it's a situation where sometimes there'll be someone who discovers a spouse doing something that, that enrages them and, and they black out and then they believe they're not guilty by reason of insanity. You're saying that's not, that's not a, that's not, that's not appropriate. That's wrong. Nope, that's not, that's not insanity. I mean, yeah, I mean, think about the, the movies. I mean, Joker, the Joker movie portrays mental illness and and violence and, and him as an example. And, um, you know, that's that's really not a great example of what happens in everyday life. Very few movies actually accurately depict, I think, mental illness. A Beautiful Mind is one example. Um, but but yes, it's, it's not that you black out and then you wake up and the next thing you know, your wife's dead next to you. But that can happen. I'm not saying that's not a type of crime, but that's not, that's not an insanity defense. Very interesting. Um, you wanted to talk about some of the myths. One myth is that, that people get away with it. In other words, once you're found um, criminally insane, well, it's like not much happens. What, what about the myth of people get away with it? Yeah, and I really worry that sometimes this is why juries don't want to find people not guilty by reason of insanity because they're really worried what will happen to that person and if they'll be a danger again. And, and I get that. And juries are not allowed to know what happens to the person after they're found insane. So it's a, it's, it's a difficult decision they make. The reality is, is that most people who are found insane, especially people who are found insane for lesser offenses, spend long, longer 
overall institutionalized than they would if they had just pled guilty. So it, sometimes it takes these defendants quite a long time before they can even become competent to go through the court system. And so they're in custody throughout that period of time. Those days are adding up. And then once they're found insane, they're typically committed to a psychiatric facility, a state psychiatric facility, where they remain until they're no longer mentally ill and a dangerous to others. And then and another thing I wanna note is that when they are released, it's a conditional release. They're released uh, often with a lot of supports in place. They're released with housing, off to a group home, with mental health treatment, with disability. And if there are um, problems or violations, while they're out, that can result in them being brought back to the hospital. So it's known as a conditional release and it can be lifelong, that conditional release. That, and but there's so much at stake there. There's so much you just said that, that is, is very interesting to me. Number one, that's a huge determination to say that there's no longer any mental illness. It seems like that would take a long time. And yet again, uh, we see some Mental illness and dangerousness at the same time. It's not illness. that your mental illness is cured, you're no longer mentally ill and dangerous. And so how often oh. does that happen? So you, you laid out at the beginning, it's so rare, 13 cases out of 250,000 arrests. So it's so rare. So of those 13 cases, how many, how long does it take someone to go through the process and, and be determined uh, to no longer be mentally ill and dangerous, generally speaking? Yeah, um, you know, it varies for each case, but it, it, it can be years. Um, there, there are some people who have been at the hospital on this statute, on this commitment for, for many years, and other people, you know, it's only been a year or so. It really depends in part on the crime as well. So that, that's going to really vary on the person and the severity of the illness and the amount of supports they have in the community to restore them. Um, and, but, you know, you can see another reason why this is not very common. If I told you, if you were charged with a crime and I told you, hey, you can plead not guilty by reason of insanity, and if you get it, you're gonna to go to a mental hospital for an indefinite period of time. I can't tell you how long, I can't tell you how short. That's a hard thing for defendants to accept. And so even defendants who have a viable insanity defense will sometimes refuse it. And if they're competent, that's their choice. You have to be competent to take an insanity defense. And some defendants say, you know that going to the hospital for you don't know how long, I, I, I'm not gonna sign up for that. I'm just gonna plead guilty. Interesting. I was also very interested in what you said, that the jury is not allowed to know. And, and you sometimes do worry. I, I would think there would be a heavy burden on you as a juror. If I find this person not guilty by reason of insanity, if I say he's insane, I, I'm concerned this dangerous person is going to be out. And if I say he's not, then I can make sure that I have locked this person up and I feel like society is safer. And so would it be better if juries knew, um, you know, what would, what about that issue there? Yeah, Ben, there's so much we need to change. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's one thing, uh, you know, and just to know, we're using definitions of the insanity defense that are now going on 200 years old. We have not changed the definition of the insanity defense in, in, centuries basically so it's outdated it doesn't reflect our current science or knowledge in the field um, and it's meant to be very restrictive and it's a legal term it's defined by 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 the legal system it's not defined by mental health professions so yeah maybe we should let juries know um, what happens to people who are found insane that it's actually the best chance they have of getting good treatment of getting good mental health treatment which then reduces their risk of committing another offense while they're mentally ill uh, much better than if they went to prison, for example. But, you know, that's not something that we're typically permitted to testify about. What, all right, that's fascinating too, that you're saying we are using definitions that are 100 years old or more, that are, that are archaic. What needs to be updated? If you could wave a magic wand and, and use the expertise you have, what needs to be updated, changed? Well, I, you know, my opinion doesn't really matter at all, but <laughs> in terms of making any change. But I think that, you know, maybe if we looked more at the symptom severity that the person had, their need for treatment, sort of just kind of looked more proactively about what what's the best outcome 
both in terms of getting the person the mental health treatment they need, because listen, being mentally ill and untreated is a terrible state of existence. It's a painful state of existence for people and they greatly suffer. But on the other hand, we don't wanna put society at risk and we don't want more people to be victimized by the actions of these individuals. So in the end, we all win if we get people the treatment they need and address their symptoms rather than specifically looking at, did they appreciate the wrongfulness of their actions and trying to define and understand such a vague concept. And mental illness, I, I, I talked to somebody and, and, about in prison, there's a huge percentage of people that are mentally ill. And are they, that whole issue of just mental illness in our society, uh, maybe that's kind of a separate thing than what we're talking about, but, but many of the people that are going to prison now would fit that definition, is that right? Yes, so the mentally ill individuals are overrepresented in the criminal justice system, significantly overrepresented in the criminal justice system. And so some people call this the criminalization of mental illness because as we are um, kind of cutting back on services in the community, uh, the jails are becoming places for to treat mental illness. And they're not designed to be that way. The prisons aren't designed that, to be that way, but they've had to become that because now they are the biggest mental health treatment facility, unfortunately. Let's walk through um, how long it takes. So let's you you are assigned a case kind of what's the first thing that happens how, how soon do you get the case generally and i know everything varies but just give us averages you know when when do you get the case how many times do you meet with them walk us through this process sure so an average case let's let's take an aggravated assault that's a charge that we see very commonly right uh you know an, an attorney um often will refer that case get get the court order for that case maybe within a month or so after they've been arrested. So the attorneys had a chance to meet with them. They've identified that there's mental health issues and they think the person needs an evaluation. So the judge orders it. We've, my service receives the order. The first thing we do is we start to gather information. So uh, we start to gather records. We start to ask the, the nice thing about being court ordered evaluators is that we get information from both sides. So we get information from the defense attorneys. We get information from the prosecution. We're friends of the court. We're not there to help one side or the other. Um, we review that information as it's coming in before we meet with the defendant so we're informed about what their history and issues are. Yeah. And then we conduct an evaluation in the jail setting typically. Um, and that evaluation is one or two visits or several visits depending on the, the complexity of the case. But normally I'd say it's one to two visits, um, maybe an hour or two at a time. And in the meantime, we are trying to look at all the pieces of information that we have and see if they tell a story, see if they fit together, see what the, what the overall arching story is. If we need more information, we go back and get more information. And then ultimately, uh, we write a report and letter to the court that informs them of our opinion. And it's just an opinion. The courts can accept it or not. It is the judge or the jury in some cases, who's the ultimate decision maker of the insanity defense. And that's interesting also that you get information from both sides. Do you feel like sometimes one side is pushing you one way or the other, or do you feel like both sides genuinely want the, the, the correct answer here? Um, I would say I feel really fortunate to work in Davidson County. I think we have a great system. Um, I think that both the, the DA's office and the public defender's office are very informed about mental health issues. And I think for the most part, they, they want the truth and they respect our opinions. Um, you know, at the end of the day, is the DA oriented to prosecution and convictions and is the defense attorney oriented toward exonerations? Yeah, yeah. But I think that uh, for the most part, people are looking for sort of the, the, uh, the objective answer from the professionals and value that opinion. How often do you have a situation, which again, I'm going from you know, what you might see on TV, and you said at the top of the show, this was rare, but does it happen where you do have, I guess, a well-funded defense that would come back with their own version, you know, whatever it is they want. You, you come back with a report that's not for the state, it's just for the judge. It's impartial and you come back with a report and that's gonna carry a lot of weight. You're with Vanderbilt, it's very important. 
then does someone, I guess either side, how often is it that either side goes and gets an alternate opinion from another doctor? It, it doesn't happen much. It doesn't happen much, especially in our county. And and, and we, we don't abuse the trust, by the way, that we have with, with the offices here. We, we really, I think, have mutual respect and 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 try to do right by everyone. But it, it doesn't happen. I mean, even in the Travis Ryan King case, you saw that there were no experts hired by the defense or prosecution. They were only court-ordered experts. So even in such a high-profile case, no one... Uh, got their own experts, so to speak. So um, I, I would say it's it's really it's really quite rare. And what it's it's very interesting that you walk in, you, you described an aggravated assault, and so mm -hmm. you get it. Um, you go in. You may have two meetings with a person, a couple of hours. How how difficult is it in that setting to really come to a determination that you're you're comfortable with? And and you must do that, right? You you must be comfortable with whatever determination right. you're you're putting out there for the court how difficult is it in that setting in a in a, in a jail if that's where this is is, is happening um mm -hmm. to come to that determination yeah so two things one is the general rule is if we don't feel comfortable then we don't have enough information and we don't offer an opinion until we have enough information so um you know a lot of people think that most of our time is what's spent face to face with the defendant. In reality, most of our time is actually going through reams and reams of records in a case that sometimes takes us hours and hours to review. Um, so, so there's a lot of behind the scenes work that goes on that may not be apparent to most people. But yeah, if we're not comfortable, we don't offer an opinion, we get more information. And then the second thing is that there are some cases that are gray. There are some cases that we don't know how to call. It's really a tough call and it, it doesn't happen much, but we'll say, listen, this is the evidence that supports insanity. This is the evidence that doesn't. It's a hard call. We leave it We leave it to the trier fact to make that decision. We're, we're gonna help you organize it. We're gonna help you lay it out, but ultimately we can't make that tough opinion. Do you think we're seeing this more and more? I mean, there's been a lot of talk about the pandemic and the impact it's had on, on mental health of people. Do you think we're going to see more mental illness, more um, insanity in, in, in our courtrooms and that kind of defense out there? It's very rare now, but do you, what, what do you think about going forward? So that 13 number is a record low for the last fiscal year. So before the pandemic, we actually had more people being found not guilty by reason of insanity. Now, not an incredibly high number, but more like 30, for example, instead of 13. Are we gonna see more mentally ill people in the criminal justice system? I think the answer to that is probably yes. I think that uh, with the pandemic, people have been incredibly stressed. Uh, people have not functioned at their best. People have not been able to access services or at least face-to-face -face services like they normally have. And so I do think that unless we make some important changes, that the criminal justice system is going to continue to house a large number of mentally ill individuals. Will they qualify for an insanity defense? Probably not, because it's still such a strict standard. So probably we're not going to capture many, many mentally ill people with an insanity defense. Um, so there has to be sort of other ways to get them treatment that they need. All right, we're going to take a break, and uh, I have more questions when we come back. And if you want to call in, there's the number, 615-737-PLUS, 615-737-7587. We'll take a break. We'll be back right after this.